100,000 rose seeds scattered across barren sand. Experts predicted total failure. Twelve months later, over 50,000 acres of the Taklamakan Desert, one of Earth's most unforgiving landscapes, had transformed into a sea of blooming flowers. This wasn't a publicity stunt. This was warfare against desertification, fought with petals instead of bullets. 100,000 rose seeds scattered across barren sand. Experts predicted total failure. Twelve months later, over 50,000 acres of the Taklamakan Desert, one of Earth's most unforgiving landscapes, had transformed into a sea of blooming flowers. This wasn't a publicity stunt. This was warfare against desertification, fought with petals instead of bullets. China faces one of the planet's most severe desertification crises. At the heart of this crisis sits the Taklamakan Desert, sprawling across 337,600 square kilometers in Xinjiang's Tarim Basin. To put that in perspective, that's roughly three times the size of South Korea. This monster ranks as the world's second largest shifting desert, and it's hungry, constantly consuming farmland, burying roads, and destabilizing entire ecosystems. The numbers tell a grim story. Mobile sand dunes cover 258,400 square kilometers of the Taklamakan. Some of these dunes tower 300 meters high, equivalent to a 100-story skyscraper made entirely of sand. For decades, Xinjiang's farming communities watched helplessly as their livelihoods disappeared beneath advancing waves of desert. Annual rainfall here barely touches 100 millimeters. Meanwhile, evaporation rates exceed 3,400 millimeters per year. More than three quarters of the surface consists of unstable, constantly shifting sand. Conventional wisdom said nothing delicate could survive here, certainly not roses. But conventional wisdom was about to be challenged. Since 1978, Chinese agricultural scientists and farmers have been constructing what might be humanity's most ambitious environmental defense system, a 3,046-kilometer green barrier encircling the desert's edges. The goal wasn't merely aesthetic, this was existential. Stop the desert's expansion or lose everything. By late 2023, approximately 2,761 kilometers of this living wall had taken root. Then came November 2024, when workers planted the final rose seedling, completing a 285-kilometer stretch that had seemed impossible just years earlier. The question everyone asked was simple. How do you grow anything in a place designed to kill? The Taklamakan southern edge represents the worst possible conditions for agriculture. Wind speeds reach punishing levels. Sand dune activity intensifies. Traditional sand control methods, hardy shrubs, drought-resistant grasses, had repeatedly failed in these zones. Experts had tried everything. Nothing worked. Then a sandstorm in 2023 accidentally revealed something extraordinary. After the storm passed, researchers surveyed the damage. Nearly every newly planted Haloxylon amodendron seedling, a species specifically bred for desert conditions, had been ripped from the ground. Only scattered survivors remained. But the roses told a different story. Two-thirds of them had survived. Scientists immediately understood they'd stumbled onto something significant. Detailed analysis revealed the rose's secret weapon their root architecture. Rose roots plunge vertically three meters deep into sand layers, while simultaneously extending dense horizontal networks of lateral roots. This creates an underground web that physically locks sand in place. Above ground, the rose's thick foliage and close planting patterns create windbreaks that dramatically reduce surface erosion. The plant wasn't just surviving, it was engineering its own microenvironment. Armed with this discovery, researchers in Yutian County, Xinjiang, developed a systematic planting strategy. They mapped sand distribution patterns, analyzed prevailing wind directions, studied hydrological conditions, and identified microclimates within the desert's brutal landscape. The strategy varied by terrain. 
In flatter areas with accessible water sources, they used block planting. Dense concentrations of roses creating solid barriers. Along sand ridges and dune edges where wind activity peaked, they employed strip planting. Long, narrow bands positioned strategically to intercept sand flow. But roses alone couldn't win this fight. Udian County implemented what scientists call a tree-shrub-rose mixed planting model. Tall trees formed the first line of defense, positioned where wind and sand hit hardest. These trees acted as speed bumps, slowing wind velocity before it reached the roses. Behind this front line, shrubs with extensive root systems intertwined with rose roots, creating redundant layers of sand stabilization while improving soil structure. This ecological engineering increased rose survival rates by more than 60%. Meanwhile, plant geneticists worked in laboratories, cultivating drought-resistant rose varieties through selective breeding and grafting. These new cultivars weren't just hardier. They were specifically designed for desert warfare, combining sand stabilization properties with the ability to bloom in conditions that would kill their commercial cousins. The result? 100,000 rose seeds deployed across 50,000 acres of hostile territory. But survival remained precarious. Average annual rainfall in the Taklamakan barely reaches 80 millimeters, while evaporation exceeds 2,000 millimeters. During the first summer, extreme conditions began claiming rose casualties. Udian County's response was unprecedented, artificial rainfall operations. Cloud seeding aircraft targeted the rose zones, increasing local precipitation by approximately 8%. It sounds modest, but in an environment this extreme, an 8% increase meant the difference between mass die-off and survival. Most of the roses made it through summer. Yet getting farmers to participate proved almost as challenging as the environmental conditions. Initially, Xinjiang's farming communities showed little enthusiasm for desert greening projects. The work was backbreaking, the results uncertain, and financial returns non-existent. Why spend years battling sand for no reward? The Chinese government's response came in the form of a simple policy. Whoever controls the sand benefits. Farmers who planted roses received subsidies of 3 to 4 yuan per mu. Suddenly, skepticism transformed into action. But subsidies alone don't sustain industries. The government understood that economic viability required market development. Udian County received investment for rose processing facilities. More than 30 products emerged. Rose essential oil, flower tea, cosmetics, medicinal preparations. Total investment approached 2 million yuan. The economic transformation was rapid and dramatic. In 2018, Udian County expanded rose cultivation by 21,000 mu, with average yields reaching 220 kilograms per mu. By 2019, the desert rose industry had generated over 46 million yuan in increased farmer income. Seasonal employment opportunities exploded. 180,000 temporary positions created during harvest seasons alone, injecting more than 30 million yuan into local economies. Farmers selling fresh flowers, dried buds, Seedlings and even farmyard manure to processing facilities earned an additional 16 million yuan. By 2024, the numbers had grown exponentially. Annual rose yields reached 2.5 kilograms per plant. Output value per mu exceeded 6,000 yuan. More than 4,200 households saw income increases averaging 63,000 yuan per family. The roses had become a cash crop in the middle of a desert. Tourism followed inevitably. Udian County marketed itself as a destination for witnessing this ecological miracle firsthand. In 2024 alone, nearly half a million domestic and international tourists visited the desert rose fields, a 55.15% increase from the previous year. Tourism revenue approached 10 million U.S. dollars. International recognition came next. British botanists declared Utian's desert roses among the world's highest quality varieties, noting exceptional oil yields and fragrance profiles.
Laboratory analysis revealed the flowers contained 18 essential amino acids, along with compounds potentially offering antioxidant and anti-aging properties. Whether medicinal claims hold up to rigorous scientific scrutiny remains debatable. What's indisputable is the market value the international community assigns to these desert-grown flowers. Critics raised predictable objections. Water resources. Growing 50,000 acres of roses in one of Earth's driest regions sounds like ecological madness. Wouldn't massive irrigation demands further deplete already stressed water systems? The answer reveals sophisticated environmental planning. Udian County operates under a principle called greening by water availability. Expansion only occurs where water resources can sustainably support it. Drip irrigation technology, delivering water directly to root zones with minimal waste, increased water efficiency by 50% compared to traditional methods. More importantly, location matters. The roses occupy the southern edge of the Taklamakan Desert, adjacent to the Kunlun Mountains. These mountains harbor 14,000 square kilometers of glaciers, representing 30% of the mountain range's total area. Glacial meltwater provides the primary irrigation source, and this water is naturally pure, mineral-rich, and ideal for rose cultivation. Seasonal flow patterns align perfectly with rose needs. Summer peak flows when glaciers melt most aggressively account for 60 to 80 percent of annual water supply, exactly when roses require maximum irrigation. Groundwater provides additional security. The southern Taklamakan edge sits atop aquifers containing reserves equivalent to roughly 10 Lake Baikals, approximately 8 trillion cubic meters, comparable to 8 Yangtze rivers worth of water. The geography, improbably, works in the roses' favor. But if desert roses seem audacious, consider what's happening deeper in the Taklamakan. In Shea County, at the desert's heart, Chinese farmers cultivate approximately 110,000 mu of what locals call desert ginseng. The name misleads. Traditional ginseng thrives in cool, humid northeastern forests. Temperatures above 32 degrees Celsius burn its leaves. Desert conditions would kill it within days. Desert ginseng refers to Cistanch deserticola, a plant biologically unrelated to true ginseng but equally valuable. This species evolved specifically for extreme desert environments thriving where annual precipitation falls below 250 millimeters, where summer temperatures regularly exceed 40 degrees Celsius, and where day-night temperature swings can reach 30 degrees. Most plants find these conditions lethal. Cistanch deserticola finds them ideal. The plant's survival strategy is parasitic. It draws nutrients from host plant's roots while contributing to sand stabilization. But beyond mere survival, Cistanch deserticola offers economic value. During blooming periods, the plant secretes copious nectar, attracting desert pollinators and providing rare high-quality honey sources. Beekeepers have established operations around Cistanch fields, harvesting honey that commands premium prices due to its unique desert flower origins. Simultaneously, Cistanch deserticola's medicinal applications drive pharmaceutical demand. Traditional Chinese medicine has utilized the plant for centuries. Modern research explores its potential applications in various treatments. This dual-use characteristic, both medicinal crop and honey source, creates economic incentives for desert cultivation while contributing to ecosystem restoration. Farmers earn income from multiple revenue streams while plant coverage reduces wind erosion and provides habitat for desert wildlife. The broader implications extend far beyond roses and medicinal plants. What's happening in Xinjiang represents a fundamental shift in humanity's relationship with hostile environments. For millennia, deserts were spaces to avoid, endure, or flee. The default assumption was that deserts defeat human ambition. The Taklamakan project challenges that assumption. Rather than retreating from desertification, China is attempting to reverse it through massive-scale ecological engineering. Rather than accepting environmental degradation as inevitable, they're deploying botanical solutions at industrial scale. The approach isn't without critics. 
environmentalists question whether large-scale cultivation in fragile ecosystems might create unforeseen consequences. Hydrologists debate whether current water usage remains genuinely sustainable as climate patterns shift. Economists wonder whether subsidy-dependent models can achieve long-term viability without continued government support. These are legitimate concerns requiring ongoing monitoring and adaptive management. Yet the alternative, allowing desserts to continue expanding unchecked, carries its own severe consequences. Desertification threatens food security, displaces populations, and accelerates climate change through reduced carbon sequestration and increased dust emissions. The Taklamakan rose fields demonstrate that human ingenuity, when combined with scientific rigor and ecological understanding, can achieve results that seem impossible at first consideration. 100,000 rose seeds, 50,000 acres, millions of blooms where experts predicted only failure. The desert blooms not despite human intervention, but because of it. Carefully planned, scientifically informed, economically viable intervention that transforms wastelands into productive landscapes while stabilizing ecosystems and supporting communities. Whether this model can scale to address global desertification challenges remains uncertain. What's certain is that the assumptions about what's possible in Earth's harshest environments are being rewritten, one rose at a time.